Good morning, church. He is risen. That's what I'm talking about. Amen. All right, my first announcement is we've got to squeeze in. I guess there's a bunch of people here, so if you could squeeze in and make that. We have some ushers here that are trying to find people. To, no, they're not trying to find people. There is people that need chairs. So, so if you guys could squeeze in, I'd appreciate it. Hey, my name is Chuck Olson. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Community Church. I just want to welcome you guys this Easter, this fine Easter. I put my suit on or part of my suit because I wanted to look like Patrick today. Yep, that's, well, I get one clap. You don't get many claps, you get one. Right. <laughs> uh, I want to draw your attention to a couple of announcements in the bulletin, but first be in the egg hunt. So if you are third grade and younger, you got to listen here now. It's not just a free-for-all, even though when you get in there, it's a free-for-all. We know it's a free-for-all. But after service, if you could line up on the left side of the lobby out here, or that'd be, yep, go to the left side, and there will be people out there that will have a, an activity bag. They'll hand you a bag. They'll let people into the Easter egg hunt. That's going to be indoor. I know not as cool as outdoor, but so when you leave, just line up over there by the TV, and there will be people there to help guide your little one to making a haul this morning. Yeah, that's right. In your announcement today, there's a connection card. If you guys could fill this out, stop by the connection point, out your doors and to the right. There's some people out there that would like to get to know you, uh, get connected in our church, hear what's going on around here. Also, in we're talking about August already. I'm skipping so far forward. We have VBS coming up here in August, but that will be a perfect way to get some of these rugrats that are here for the Easter egg hunt to VBS so we can teach them about Jesus and we can do some thing. Also, on April 27th, there's a prayer and worship night here at Faith Community. So all this stuff, information you can find on the events page, fccnr.org, and you can go there, get signed up, find out what's, what's going on here. As we prepare to worship today, I want to read this piece of scripture, and we'll make this thing happen. This is in Isaiah 25. Ooh, it just got quiet in there. That was like perfect timing. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine of rich food full of marrow and aged wine well refined. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over his peoples. The veil that is spread all over the nations, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord we have waited for. For him, let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Father, we're thankful for today. We're thankful for our salvation, God. We just ask for a blessing today, God. Let us be a reflection of you, Lord. Please bless our time as we enter into worship, God. Will you guys stand with me? Falling down. 
may be seated. As we go to the Lord in prayer today, um, just a couple of things. We want to be praying for uh, Congress. Scripture tells us to be praying for kings and those in high authority. And today we pray for the House of Representatives, and particularly for uh, the representative from Wisconsin, Representative Tim Tiffany. Uh, we also we want to be praying for other churches. This Lord's Day, as we gather to celebrate the resurrection, we want to pray for uh, the River Church in River Falls, and particularly for their pastor, Caleb Van Roekel. Um, and then also we want to pray for those from our congregation who are unable to join us today. Uh, many of you have heard from uh, the prayer list that uh, Debbie Haig's father was on hospice, and he passed away yesterday. And so we want to be praying for Debbie and for her family as well. Would you pray with me? Lord, your word says in Psalm 18, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry to him reached his ears. Lord, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. Father, we come before you recognizing that apart from the death and resurrection of Jesus, there is no hope. And yet this psalm, which speaks of the righteous man who is rescued from his enemy, that is rescued from the cords of death, is embodied to perfection by the Lord Jesus. That you did not let your Holy One see destruction. You did not allow him to remain in the place of the dead. Instead, you brought him back to life. And because he has come to life, there is eternal life for all who would repent and believe in him. And so, Lord, we gather this Lord's Day to worship the triune God, to celebrate the resurrection, our victory, our D-Day, the day that we were bought back, that we were redeemed from Satan, sin, and death. And so, Lord, would you help us to worship in spirit and in truth? Would you help me to rightly divide the word of truth? Would you help the praise team to lead us in songs of truth that the word of Christ may dwell in us richly? Father, we pray for those uh, who are gathering around the world. And we, we recognize that not everybody gets to gather in freedom. Not everybody gets to gather in safety. And yet they still come because you are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our lives. And so, Lord, we pray specifically for our brothers and sisters across the world who are facing persecution and oppression. For those in China, in North Korea, for those in Nigeria, for those in North Africa, for those in Central Asia, Lord, we pray that you would protect them and that they, you would hide them under the shadow of your wings and that you would be pleased as we worship you. Father, we pray for the River Church and River Falls and particularly for Pastor Caleb Van Roco. Lord, would you just unclamor his tongue, clear his mind, allow him to faithfully proclaim your word, your gospel this morning, and would you meet with your people there as you meet with us here. Father, we are also commanded to pray for those in leadership to honor the emperor. And so, Lord, we pray for our Congress. We, we pray for those who have been placed in authority in order to legislate righteousness. And we pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment. We pray particularly those who are representatives from the state of Wisconsin and specifically for Tim Tiffany. Lord, would you bless him? Would you draw him to yourself in faith in Christ? Would you allow him to promote good laws? Would you help him to work for justice according to your word? And Lord, we pray that you would be with our country, that you'd be with our community. But right now, as we gather, we just want you to meet with us as well. We come with empty hands. We come with a heart of faith, anticipating your grace. And we pray, oh Lord, meet with us. We have nothing apart from you. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior See you. 
have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. It, it is our pattern here at Faith Community Church to preach consecutively, verse by verse, line by line through books of the Bible. But for Easter, we're going to skip forward. We're going to flip to the end of the story. We're going to come after the passion, after the death of the Lord Jesus. And today we come to Luke chapter 24, specifically verses 1 through 12. But for the sake of context, we're going to go ahead and back up two verses to Luke chapter 23, verse 55 and 56, and then we're going to read our passage for today. So Luke chapter 23, verse 55, and the text is on the screen behind me. Dr. Luke writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. The women who had come with him from Galilee, followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their heads to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hand, hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. Thus ends this reading of God's holy and authoritative word. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me? Lord, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so, Lord, we ask, would you speak to us this morning? Lord, we pray that they would not hear your servant, but that they would hear the voice of the good shepherd calling them, offering hope, offering eternal life through his empty tomb, through him conquering death. Master, would you help me this morning? Would you be with us? Prepare our hearts for your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You know, it seems crazy to me, but it's been almost a quarter of a century since the book, The Case for Christ, a New York Times bestseller, was first published. It's incredible. The Case for Christ is a study done by a man named Lee Strobel, who later became a pastor. But at the beginning of the book, he shares something of his testimony, how, in fact, he himself came to Christ. Strobel was a graduate of Yale Law School. He was a journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And by his own admission, he was a self-professed atheist. He worked hard. He partied hard. And according to his own confession, he had really no time for his own family. But God was going to turn Lee Strobel's life upside down because in the autumn of 1979, his wife, Leslie, became a Christian. And this left Strobel stunned. He, he couldn't believe it. He writes in the book, quote, I rolled my eyes and braced for the worst, feeling like the victim of a bait and switch scam. According to Strobel's own words, he was afraid that his carefree wife, his fun loving wife, his risk taking wife was going to become a prude, was going to become a closed minded bigot. And yet he couldn't get past the curiosity of her faith. And so he wanted to go deeper. He wanted to find out what this Christianity thing was all about. And so using his skills as a journalist, he launched an all-out investigation into the facts surrounding Christ in the Bible. He wrote, quote, Setting aside my self-interests and prejudices as best I could, I read books 
interviewed experts, asked questions, analyzed history, explored archaeology, studied ancient literature, and for the first time in my life, picked apart the Bible verse by verse. I plunged into the case with more vigor than with any case I had ever pursued. And for two long years, Strobel analyzed and investigated all the evidence he could find. He talked to the world's best experts on the subject. And the case culminated with the claim that Jesus had rose from the dead. He zeroed in on that and said, if that's not true, nothing else matters. And yet, at the end of his book, Strobel concludes, quote, by November 8th, 1981, my journalistic skepticism toward the nat- supernatural had melted in light of the breathtaking historical evidence that the resurrection of Jesus was a real historical event. In fact, my mind could not conjure up a single explanation that fit the evidence of history nearly as well as the conclusion that Jesus was who he claimed to be, namely the one and only Son of God. The atheism I had embraced for so long buckled under the weight of historical truth. That is a profound paragraph of a man who intellectually is honest enough to look at the evidence and not allow his prejudice to come into it as he examines it, as he sees the truth of history, as he sees the truth of archaeology, as he hears the veracity of Scripture, he comes to the conclusion he has been wrong all this time. And he actually came to saving faith in Jesus. But friends, here's what I don't want you to miss. Strobel was absolutely right to zero in on the resurrection. That really is the linchpin upon which Christianity is held together. It's the bedrock upon which the building of Christianity either stands or falls. If there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. And that's not just my opinion. That's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He writes, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. No, no. Sometimes you hear people say, well, even if it's not true, I lived a good life. Well, then your Christianity is not pressing in hard enough. Or sometimes you hear people say, well, it it doesn't really matter if Jesus walked out of the tomb in his body, literally, historically. It's enough that he lives spiritually in my heart. It's the hope that endures. It's not really the historical facts. It's, It's what it does for my spirit. And yet the Apostle Paul says all of that is nonsense. The Apostle Paul says, if it's not true, Christianity is a bad joke and a cruel one at that. Because if Christianity is not true, if the resurrection has not taken place, there is no for forgiveness of sins. There is no resurrection unto life. There is no eternal life. We are still under the wrath of God. Paul says, if the resurrection is not true, we are of all men most to be pitied. That means the resurrection is at the heart of our faith. And you understand, that's implicit in our text today in Luke 24. There's a reason the disciples don't show up at the tomb. And that's because they didn't think there was anything to show up for. They understood no resurrection, no Christianity, which means because they're not anticipating a resurrection, That everything that they've worked for for the past three years, all the miracles that they observed, all the beautiful things they saw Jesus do, everything that they had hoped about Jesus had died when Jesus did. As far as they're concerned, Christianity is a failed venture, which is why they scattered. And that brings us to our first point. Apart from the resurrection, the message of Christianity does not make sense. Apart from the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus, Christianity does not make any sense. It's not worth giving your life to. It's not worth giving your Sunday morning to. And yet, if the resurrection is true, everything changes. And the Apostle Paul says, but Christ has been raised from the dead. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, he begins by saying, for I deliver to you as of first importance, What does that mean? Top priority. What I also received. 
In other words, I didn't come up with this. It's not mythology. It's not my fancy. No, no, no. Instead, this is something that I received personally. I didn't make it up. It didn't start with me. It's not going to end with me. I'm going to pass it on to you. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Cephas being Peter, the twelve being the apostles. It goes on in verse 6. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all of the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul's saying the gospel we preach, the gospel that serves as the bedrock for our faith, the reason we get up in the morning, the reason we do what we do is found in Jesus, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection for the forgiveness of sinners, anybody and everybody who will repent and believe in him. And Paul's point is this, you can't convince me it's not true. I saw him. He appeared to me. He appeared long after, even after he ascended into heaven. I am an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. I know him. You can't convince me he doesn't exist. Moreover, this is not up to me. This is not just about me. It's not just I could have had a massive hallucination or maybe I ate something weird before I went to bed and had a funky dream. No, no, no. This happened to 500 people. It happened to the apostles. It happened to Peter. It happened to 500 dudes at the same time, people who weren't expecting this, people who didn't believe anymore, and yet Jesus appeared to them. And there's an implicit challenge there, friends. As the Apostle Paul lays out the evidence for the resurrection, as he says, most of them are still alive, though some of them have died. The challenge to the church of Corinth receiving this letter is this. If you don't believe it, dig it up yourself. Check it out. Go look at the empty tomb. Go over to the eyewitnesses in Jerusalem and ask them. Ask them what they saw. Ask them what they heard. Ask them how they touched him. Ask them how they saw him eat. Ask him how they saw him teach. Ask him how they saw him ascend into heaven. Examine the evidence for yourself. And so here's my challenge for you today. As we look at the text, as we hear the message of the resurrection, if you are not a Christian here today, I challenge you, look into the resurrection. Find there a certainty for your faith. Christianity is not a leap in the dark. That's not biblical, that's Immanuel Kant. Christian faith is a faith that is grounded in truth. It is an intellectual faith that is satisfying to the mind and the heart. It is rooted in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And so examine the evidence for yourself. It's a falsifiable truth claim made in space and time. Look into the resurrection. But if you are a Christian, let me encourage you that as we see the evidence, as we hear the message that we would find hope here, that, that you would find an anchor for your soul, that in the midst of the loss that's found in life, in the midst of the billowing waves of this life, that your faith would remain certain because it's founded on the bedrock that is Jesus Christ, the living God-man, the Son of God, the King of the universe. Let this Hold you when nothing else can, when everything else is ripped away. Find hope here in Jesus. Now, as we drop into our text for today, we're met with the group of women, women who are described as those who had come with Jesus from Galilee. These are women who had been with Jesus throughout his earthly ministry. These are women who had stuck with Jesus even in the midst of crucifixion. They had watched him on the cross. They had seen him die. They had seen the, the spear pierced the side and into his heart, breaking the pericardium and water and blood flowing out. They had been there for it all. And I find it absolutely ironic that when Jesus' apostles, when Jesus' disciples, men, flee when Jesus is arrested, these women stay. But they have been there through it all. And now they seek to honor Jesus by going to the tomb. Now, a couple of things are just absolutely astounding about that. Number one, this is a time period where we're living in a very misogynistic age. 
It's embarrassing to talk about women because women were seen as less than. They weren't seen as fully equals to men. And and yet, according to Scripture, women are equally created in the image of God and endowed with value and inherent dignity, the same that is found in a man. And the point that God makes in including this record of the women going to the tomb first is women have value. Women are loved by God, regardless of what the culture or society says. But second, this also lends to the ring of authenticity when it comes to the accounts of the resurrection. You see, if you were making this story up, you wouldn't include this detail. No one would come up on this on their own because it seems self-defeating. Women weren't trusted back then. Women weren't esteemed back then. They weren't respected back then. They were believed to have lesser intellectual faculties. Their minds were less developed according to the viewpoint of society. Their testimony was not acceptable in a court of law. And yet Dr. Luke writes that it's going to be women who are the eyewitnesses to the empty tomb, and it's going to be women who are the first eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ. Don't miss that. The very fact that that's included is another piece of evidence that says this is not mythology. You wouldn't make this this stuff up. Only if it was true would you include it. And so women have been with Jesus through his death. They've been with him as he comes off of the cross. And then they have to pause. They have to back off. Why? Because it's the Sabbath. It's Saturday. They have to observe the commandment of God's word. And so they go home. I can't imagine what they were thinking at that that point. But on the first day of the week, on Sunday, they gather together. They grab spices and ointments in order to prepare the body. And they go to the tomb where Jesus has been laid. And as they head towards the tomb, we know a couple of other things from Scripture have taken place at this point. Number one, the tomb has been sealed by Roman, uh, by Roman pronouncement. The, the Jewish religious leaders, the ones who instigated the crucifixion of Jesus, have gone to Pontius Pilate and said, listen, this guy was a problem when he lived. He's going to be even a bigger problem if, when he, he's dead if they take the body or if somebody claims he was resurrected. So put a guard, seal the tomb. So they seal the tomb. Pontius Pilate actually puts a guard of Roman soldiers to watch over a dead guy, to watch over a grave. And so the women are heading to the tomb, and they know all this, and they got to be wondering, okay, how is this going to go? What's this going to look like? And yet, when they get to the tomb, there is no guard. And the massive stone that would have sealed the tomb has been rolled away. And they're confused. They don't know what to do with this. When the women show up, there's no understanding. The verse 4 says they were perplexed. They weren't expecting this. And again, this has the ring of authenticity to it because if you read the whole story, none of Jesus' disciples come off as particularly bright. Have you noticed this? And if you were just writing this story, if you were making this up, wouldn't you want to make yourself look good? And yet the women are perplexed. They're not expecting the resurrection. They're not coming out of faith. They're coming out of love. And yet, even when they do hear the message of the resurrection and they go and tell the apostles, verse 11 says, but these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. Even Peter, good old Peter, who actually gets up off his duff, he runs to the tomb, he looks in the tomb, he sees the empty tomb, he sees the cloth lying there. The text says he marveled, but it does not say he believed. They still don't get it. It's not until the angels show up that they begin to comprehend what's going on. So look with me at verses four through seven. It says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, he but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the, and on the third day rise. Now we know from the other accounts of the gospels that these two men in dazzling apparel are angels. The idea that they're in dazzling apparel seems to give evidence to that. The fact that the ladies bow their heads to the ground is another piece of evidence because you didn't do that even in a misogynistic society. It wasn't proper and it wasn't appropriate for you to bow down before any man. 
and yet they do this here, which seems to imply there's a recognition on their part that these are no ordinary men. They demonstrate a supernatural knowledge that even the apostles don't possess at this point. And yet look at what they command the ladies to do. Remember what Jesus told you. Before you even got to Jerusalem, before Palm Sunday, all the way back in Galilee, he called this. How are you shocked? This is the whole point of the incarnation. Jesus has been telling you this was coming from the very beginning. And if you look at the Bible, you know that. So in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. In Matthew 16, he says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Matthew 17, As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. Mark chapter 8, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Luke chapter 9, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Do you get the point? You cannot split these things apart. The resurrection only makes sense in context. It's not a standalone event. The empty tomb is not enough unless you understand it. Unless you understand and believe the words of the Lord Jesus, his resurrection will not help you. The women see the tomb. They don't get it. Peter sees the tomb. Doesn't get it. The men hear the report of the resurrection. They don't believe it. And that leads us to our second point. The words of Jesus interpret the work of Jesus. The words of Jesus interpret the work of Jesus. If you want to understand the resurrection, don't come up with your own ideas. Look to what Jesus says about it. I started this sermon off by sharing with you the story of Lee Strobel and how he came to saving faith in Jesus. And Roughly from 1979 to 1981 is when God got a hold of him. Ironically, at about the same time around the world, there was a man named Pincus Lapid, who was a Jewish scholar and an Israeli historian. And Pincus did something that most Jews don't do. He investigated the claims of Jesus and particularly the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he published a book in 1982. The book is entitled, The Resurrection of Jesus, colon, A Jewish Perspective. And in this book, after analyzing all the data, and all the different evidence and variables, he concluded that Jesus of Nazareth was raised by God from the dead on the third day without a doubt. He goes on. He argues that all alternative explanations cannot possibly hold water. They're not logical. They're not consistent. They're not rational. It's interesting. He, around the same time, comes to the same conclusion as Lee Strobel, and yet, there's something different about Pincus Lapid. You see, the tragic thing about Lapid is, as best we know, he never became a Christian. He lived his entire life, even after admitting, yes, Jesus was raised from the grave. And he never bowed the knee to Jesus. Why? He knew enough, but he had no place in his theology for a crucified and resurrected Messiah in the middle of history. He came to the conclusion that yes, God raised Jesus from the dead, but Jesus is only meant to prepare the way for the real Messiah who will come one day, the future Messiah. And we're left scratching our heads going, how is that possible? And it's because he does not allow God's word to interpret itself. You see, the resurrection fits within the broader narrative of Scripture in general and the gospel in particular. That's Luke's whole point throughout chapter 24, that all of Scripture has been building to this moment, that this is the apex of history. Everybody behind it looks forward to it. Everybody after it looks back. And you can't divorce the resurrection from the rest of God's word. It's an all or nothing proposition. That's why the angels say what they say in verses 6 and 7. 
It's why Jesus is going to say what he says in the very next passage in Luke 24. In Luke 24, he sees his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Jesus, who's been resurrected, he sees his disciples, and yet they don't recognize him. They're heading out, and yet they're absolutely distraught. And Jesus asks them, hey, why are you guys so down in the mouth? To which they reply, don't you know anything? We thought this Jesus guy, we, we believed in him, we followed him, we thought he was the one to redeem Israel. And yet, what does Jesus say to them? Verses 25 through 27, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. We talked about this before, but Moses and all the prophets, that's technical Jewish language. Because Moses is a reference to the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The prophets are the last books in the Hebrew Bible, which means he's saying from Genesis to Malachi, it's all about me. All of Scripture is about pointing to the revelation of God in Christ. That Jesus was the perfect God-man who came into this world to save sinners. That in him, the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. That he was the exact imprint of the nature of God who being in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. and said he lowered himself. He emptied himself. He took on the form of man. He lived amongst us in a broken world. He suffered alongside us. He perfectly obeyed the law of God, fulfilling all righteousness and receiving for himself a reward. But instead of taking it, he gives it to all of his people. And then he takes from them their sins and the punishment that they deserve and he takes it upon himself. So at the cross, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus so that it might not be poured out on you. And then three days later, Jesus conquered Satan, sin, and the grave, offering hope and eternal life to anybody and everybody who would believe in him. That's the gospel. That's the story of redemption. That's what the whole Bible is getting to. If you miss that, you've missed the entire point of the book. You know, on Friday, Pastor Chuck read to us a passage of Scripture from Isaiah 53. And Isaiah was a prophet that lived roughly 700 years before Jesus was ever born. Let me just remind you of some of that passage. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus is a propitiatory sacrifice who atones for the sins of his people. He redeems us from the power of Satan, but he also rescues us from the power and the wrath of God. That was written 700 years before Jesus was ever born. But you know, it gets even better. In verse 9 of chapter 53, it says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. That's fascinating because Jesus was crucified between two thieves. And then when he was buried, he wasn't buried in his own family tomb. He was buried in a new tomb that was owned by Joseph of Arimathea, one of the Sanhedrin, one of the Jewish leaders of prominence, power, and wealth. He was laid in the tomb of a rich man. Or how about verse 10? Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. Now, here's my question. How does that work? Right? If God just crushed him, if he has died the death of an atoning sacrifice, if his grave was with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, then how exactly does he prolong his days? What could that even possibly mean? Who could possibly fulfill that? And yet 700 years later, after Jesus made an atoning sacrifice, after he was laid in the tomb, he lives. And not just another 10 years, he lives for all of eternity. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah prophesies the death of Jesus, but also implicitly prophesies the resurrection of Jesus. 
Isn't it incredible how all of Scripture forms a cohesive whole? This supernatural beauty, this supernatural brilliance. Do you see why I say this should be an anchor for your soul? This should be the bedrock of your faith, that you can trust God, you can trust his word. Jesus is who he says he is. He did what he said he would do, and that means that his word is sure and his promises are certain. You can take it to the bank. You can trust the promises of Jesus, and that means there's hope because Jesus promises eternal life. Scripture says, but to all who did receive him, who called upon his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And friends, because Jesus' tomb is empty, if you are a Christian here today, one day your grave will be empty as well. It's a wonderful thought. There's a story of an old pastor from the 18th century, a man named John Ryland, famous Baptist preacher. And in 1784, he was asked to preach the funeral for one of his dear friends and fellow minister, a guy named Andrew Gifford. And as he concluded his sermon, here were his words, Farewell, dear old man. We leave you in the past possession of death till the resurrection day. But we will bear witness against you, O king of terrors. At the mouth of this dungeon, you shall not always have possession of this body. It shall be demanded of you by the great conqueror, Jesus himself. And at that moment, you shall resign your prisoner. You shall give him back. O oh, you ministers of Christ, you people of God, you surrounding spectators, prepare, prepare to meet this old servant of Christ at that day, at that hour, when this whole place shall be nothing but life and death shall be swallowed up in victory. I love that. And yet here's my question. How could Ryland preach with such confidence? How could he preach that with such certainty that he would see his friend again? Because he had the hope of the resurrection. Because he knew in the one in whom he had believed. Here's my question. Do you have that confidence today? Do you know in the one you have believed? Do you know he's still alive? Do you know the hope of the resurrection? Is it an anchor for your soul? As John Ryland says, have you prepared yourself? Because that leads us to our third point. The resurrection demands a decision. The resurrection of Jesus Christ demands a response from everybody and anybody who hears this message. What will you do with it? What is your response? Well, if you are a Christian here today, your response should be the same as the women in this story. They provide the example, the paradigm of what righteousness looks like in response to the hope of the gospel. They go and tell others. They can't keep it to themselves. They can't help it. It's, it's oozing out of them. It's pouring forth from them. Listen, you, you gotta, I, we saw angels in dazzling apparel, and, and they told us that Jesus is, has been risen, and they told us about all these times that apparently Jesus told us that we just didn't remember. But, but, but the point is, Jesus is alive. And even when men won't listen to them, they still keep telling others. They can't get past it because they can't get past Jesus, and that means it comes out of their mouth. There's fire in their eyes again. There's hope in their hearts again. And dear friends, if you are a Christian, the same should be true of you today. That's why Dr. Luke ends chapter 24 with his own rendition of Jesus' great commission. In verses 44 through 48, he says, Then he said to them, These are my words that I have spoken to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things. Our job is to proclaim the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus to all peoples, 
to all ethnicities, to all nations, to both genders, to young and old, to anybody and everybody we encounter. Your job is to go and tell. Easter does not end with the preacher preaching a sermon. Instead, the hope of the resurrection should propel you. It should motivate you. The love of Christ should compel you to go out and share that hope with other people. And if you are not a Christian here today, remember my challenge. Come and see. Like the Apostle Peter yourself, get up and look at the evidence. Look at the book. Hear his message. Remember his words. And find for yourself eternal life in the light of Christ. Several years ago, I was doing a jail Bible study and I was talking to a young man about Jesus. I was trying to share with him Christianity and he just, he wasn't really digging it, but the man had a terminal disease. He was, he was a young buck, but he was going to die. And so I just felt this burden. I had to offer him the hope of the gospel and, and yet he was so hostile and so eventually I started to back off and I, I just resorted to asking questions. I said, okay, so, so tell me about you. Tell me, what, what do you believe? How do you know what you know? What, what, what is the source of, of how you understand the world around you? And he said, well, it's science. Science explains everything. Science is it for me. And I said, okay, well, let me just poke that for a second. Is there anything in your life is there anything in your experience that science cannot explain? He thought about it for a second. He goes, yeah, I guess there is. He said, what would that be? He said, well, what comes first to mind is the fact that science doesn't explain or tell me what happens when I die. That's a good one. And then he looked at me and said, yeah, only you people in your book claim to know the answer to that one. Then he asked me a question. How can you be so sure? You need to have an answer to that question. And I looked at him and said, because we follow a guy who died and then conquered, be conquered death, and he came back and told us. That's how we know. That's how we have hope. And that man not only told us what happens to us after we die, that man claimed to be the very son of God, the perfect God in human form. And he gives us his word, he gives us his book that we might know him, that we might believe him, and that through believing in his name, we might have eternal life. Friends, do you know this Jesus? Do you know this hope? Let's pray. Father, we ask for all here, that you would bless them. And Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to behold the wonders of your word, that you would incline our heart to the truth of your word, and that you would satisfy us this morning with your steadfast love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
before I offer the benediction, let me just encourage you, if you want to talk to somebody about the resurrection, both myself and Pastor Chuck will be up here for a couple of minutes to talk to anybody who needs to. We also have people at the exit and people at the cross that want to pray with you. Let me offer a benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. God bless you.